Okay, so as I was saying, <laughs> my work is derived from all the global flyways. Um, and now I need to get rid of this. No, I, I can't see my own screen, it's a problem. Okay, um, <laughs> the, the, the East Asian flyway, as you'll probably hear several times through this conference, is the most shorebird diverse flyway in the, in the world. And there's a, there's a, a di in different aspects, it's highly diverse. In high species diversity, um, for instance, uh, there's 52 species migrating along the flyway at least, and this doesn't even count um, short distance migrants within a region. Um, I'm going to be talking mostly about Arctic and subarctic breeding birds. So in, in our fly, we have 30 of those 52 species breed in the, in the Arctic, subarctic regions of the flyway. And if you, if you consider other birds that uh, breed in those areas, but, but mainly migrate on different flyways, there's another 14 species. So the Arctic regions of this flyway are extremely diverse. Um, and the, but there's also high within species diversity. There's at least seven species on the flyway that, have, that are represented by multiple described subspecies. And in some cases, we have globally distributed species that have their highest subspecific diversity in this flyway. Uh, a great example is the Dunlin, where there's four or five subspecies using the, just this flyway. Um, and and this, uh, this within species diversity particularly is important if you're thinking about conservation or just understanding what population you are actually studying and how it's connected to other parts of the flyway. Um, so why is this region so diverse with shorebirds? One of the main reasons is that uh, during the last ice age, around 20,000 years ago, most of the Arctic regions of the world were covered with ice. However, in, the, in this flyway, there, there was a large uh, glacial refugium spanning from Alaska into uh, the central, almost the central Russian Arctic. And so the, the, um, the flyways here and, and, the species, and the subspecies here can have a, long, a much longer regional history uh, with, with which to develop substructure or to change their migratory uh, patterns. Whereas, whereas the flyways in other parts of the world are much younger in general for Arctic breeding shorebirds. Also, this, this uh, interesting part of this area is, you see the light areas of this map, if you can see my mouse. And that is uh, when the sea level which was much lower during the last glacial maximum, meaning that there was a land bridge connecting Alaska to the Russian Arctic. And this disappeared about 11,000 years ago, um, meaning that also species and subspecies in this area were, were subdivided by a fragmenting habitat as sea levels rose. It's a very interesting area to be studying uh, shorebird diversity. I'm gonna be talking about three species that are widespread on this flyway, all of which have a very interesting relationship with Beringia and the, and the uh, post-glacial post flyways. Um, so each of these have uh, multiple uh, subspecies across the globe, but also have their highest diversity within this flyway, as I'll show you. Um, my approach is uh, genetic. I'm using genome-wide, thousands of genome-wide markers. Um, so, um, as opposed to a lot of studies you might see in the, in the past that use a single locus or several microsatellites, this approach tends to uh, um, get genome-wide information and, and have a much more a higher resolution for very recent things like, like I'm talking about today. So I have hundreds of global samples from each species and thousands of genetic loci. So the, the first uh, species I'm gonna talk about is black-tailed godwit. Now, black-tailed goblet has a large Palearctic distribution. Much of it is temperate, especially in the Europe, uh, in the western parts of its range. But there are three described subspecies. So we have Isl Islamica breeding far in the, in the west. And we have a, a, a widespread uh, nominate subspecies. And then, and then one, one described subspecies in, in this flyway. And you can see just by the, the diverse wintering area spanning a lot of disjunct areas and this uh, very disjunct breeding distribution in our flyway that we could get some very interesting population patterns. So um, there's, there's uh, countless genetic analyses that you can do with the, the data that I have, but I'm just gonna present one type of analysis because it's, uh, I think it really represents what I'm talking about very well and, and it's very visual. And you don't have to get into lots of statistics to understand it. Um, but I'm going to walk you through it so you really understand the graphics that I'm giving you. I'm doing admixture analysis, which, which basically takes the global uh, variation that you see and um, 
classifies it into discrete lineages. This, you can think of it a bit like a PCA in which um, uh, similar data is grouped together, but in this case, it's used to, inferred, to infer ancestral lineages, which then can tell you about the relatedness of populations and individuals that you're studying. So what, what I'm showing down here is each, each individual is, is uh, represented by a vertical bar. And so these will pile up next to each other when I have multiple individuals. And, and the colors that you will see, um, which have nothing to do with the population colors on the maps, by the way, in case you get confused, but they're, um, they're, they're, they're indicating these different lineages. So in this case, this one individual uh, from zero to 100 is 100% this one orange lineage. Now, if I get another individual, it might be um, designated with another color, meaning that these two birds are basically unrelated, uh, coming from different lineages. And then if I add um, individuals to this data set, I can have different patterns. We could infer a completely unrelated third lineage, or we could start seeing that certain individuals have ancestry from both or all three lineages. For instance, this, uh, this bird here has a, what, it, what this is really saying is that about 60% of its genome is related to this lineage and 40, this one. So this, now you start to be able to compare populations and groups for sort of spatial inference. For instance, here we, we, we can compare these two groups and, and all of these individuals are sort of uh, purebred orange, meaning that these two groups should be lumped as a, a sort of um, panmictic interbreeding group one population where we might see other patterns. Here's one population where the individuals within it are, are fairly homogenous, but they definitely have a, a, a history of admixture between different lineages in the past. Or you could have a group where the individuals within the group are very heterogeneous, and now you know that something else is going on than, than your, uh, the, these, these individuals can't be classified as having the same ancestry. So with, with that as a background, I hope you can understand my slides. If, you, if we think about now the black-tailed goblet, which I just described to you, if, if, if these three uh, subspecies that are described were the whole story, meaning that each of these is deeply diverged from the others and is not experiencing any current or historical uh, intermixing with the other groups, we would have an admixture plot that looks a bit like this with three inferred deeply diverged and very clean lineages within the samples of each population. But now I'm gonna show you what you really find, and it looks like this. So what this means is that over, over in the West, we do have a very deeply diverged and well-described subspecies in Islandica, but in, across the, the wide longitudinal range of Lamosa, we have a, a sort of genetic cline, meaning that this, this, this one subspecies has been generated either by the admixture of two historical lineages or has simply um, drifted apart through isolation at either end and now there's genetic heterogeneity. But what's, what, we're, what we really want to talk about today is what's happening on our flyway and so I'm going to um, zoom in over here to melanoroides. Now this is interesting. In our one subspecies we have several genetic patterns but the most striking is the difference between these these 10 or so individuals and the rest of my sample. And what, and what these samples came from is, is these two areas. This, these are, this group here is breeding samples from the, the Selenga River Delta near Lake Baikal. And, the, and this group here that looks very similar to them is uh, non-breeding samples from the Vietnam coast. And so what this is telling us is that these groups, the, these, these, these individuals look very similar and are probably from the same sort of breeding population whereas the rest of my samples have a different signature. And what we have here is uh, samples across a range of breeding areas in the central and uh, northeastern part of the breeding range. And they look very similar to the non-breeding samples that you can find in Australia. There's some variation, but we see that all the variation in these breeding areas seems to be captured by the Australian sample. So in simplistically, what this means is that is that birds from the, the Western non-breeding and breeding areas seem to be connected and we can't, we can't find birds from this area of the flyway over in Australia. However, while, while the east, more Eastern birds are migrating further and can be found in, and are connected with Australian non-breeding grounds. Now, you may have noticed that we also have quite a few non-breeding and breeding areas that are, that are currently unsampled, which means there could be a lot more 
interesting stories and connections to find if we get better sampling. If you want to hear more about this particular story, um, more on the ground details, you should go to Drew's talk tomorrow in the same time slot. Um, yeah. Okay, um, take a breath. <laughs> the next piece is his uh, bar tail guy. Uh, about also. three minutes to go, um, Jesse. Mm -hmm. Sorry, thank you. Oh, yeah, I wasted all my time. Okay, so we have uh, another bird with a large paleoarctic uh, um, distribution, but actually quite a, a lot of diversity within this flyway. If we look here, we see a similar pattern in which uh, the Western, Western populations are more homogenous, but we have a lot of interesting stuff going on with the ones in our flyway. And I'll get to some quick questions. Some things that jump out from this, this plot is that within Bowerai, the Alaska breeding uh, subspecies, we have a genetic cline. And this uh, is basically um, relates to a latitudinal cline within the breeding area, where with, uh, which we also know links to uh, uh, clines in both size, well, size, plumage, and timing within the subspecies. So there, there is isolation by distance within the subspecies. Over on the left, we have an interesting pattern where mens biri seems to be an ad, uh, a more recent admixed population of, of the Western populations and the, and the Alaska lineages. So there's much more to be learned about this history. And then a big question we had was the, the population of Anadurensis, which is a, a, a very small, mysterious population, and we don't know exactly what its wintering range is. So I wanted to see whether it was actually operating as a uh, independent subspecies, and I got a very strange answer from the three samples that managed to be high quality enough to land in my uh, analysis, and that's one looks like southern Bowerai, one looks like northern Bowerai, and one looks like mens Bowerai. So that this could be the um, effect of some recent founder or some interesting patterns that we have yet to unravel. So more, ne more needed on uh, anadurensis, so <laughs> it's hard to get samples, we're trying. And my last species, which is really complicated globally, is the red knot, as we all know. And again, this is a, this is a species with many uh, described subspecies around the globe, but has its highest subspecies diversity in this flyway. And again, we see the most interesting patterns in, in our flyway over here in the east. And in this one, there's some really striking things going on. First of all, is that we've seen, the, in general, the birds across from uh, west to east seem to be a, a, a gradual admixture of, of a, a western lineage with an eastern limited lineage from Alaska. Um, but what really jumps out here is, is that a new, a new lineage was inferred within Roger's eye. And this, this I don't understand yet, but we're, this, uh, this occurred in some, but not all of the samples that Pavel Tomkovich provided from his uh, disjunct breeding station, uh, breeding a site here. And it never showed up strongly in any of the New Zealand samples that I compared them with. So there is some kind of structure within Roger's eye and it's not being picked up just in the New Zealand samples. So this is a mystery that we need to unravel. And, um, and another one is that Rosa, the, the breeding populations in Wrangell Island and Alaska, which are considered Rosalari, are genetically distinguishable. Um, meaning that we have sort of two subpopulations within Rosalari. And th those, both those populations fly to eastern, uh, fly to the east to the Americas, whereas these two, these two populations mix on our flyway. But uh, there's an interesting relationship between Rogers Eye and Wrangell Island that needs to be investigated. Do I have any more time? Uh, not really. Uh, maybe a very quick wrap up and then thank okay. you. Okay. So I'm just, what I'm trying to tell you is that there's still a lot of diversity yet to be described in this flyway, not just in these species, but other ones. Um, I will be doing lots of modeling to sort of understand how these, these uh, uh, populations uh, occurred and came that way. But we, have, we still have a lot of uh, populations and regions unsampled. And, um, and surely we will find more cryptic uh, variation and surprises in uh, these and other species, which can be important for identifying conservation units and also just to get uh, insight into how the history of Beringia shaped our flyway. So thank you very much.